Welcome in. It is Big Ten today. Great to have you with us on this Monday. We are presented by Gatorade, Dave Revson, and Trent Meacham. We spend an entire season speculating about it, wondering about it, making predictions. And finally, we've got our bracket. Here we are. I think yes, Sunday was one of the best days in the sports calendar, and this is setting up maybe the, the, one of the most fun weeks in all of sports anywhere in the world. We're getting to it. Last week before the Big Ten Tournament, Dave, I predicted Illinois over Wisconsin. Yes, you did. you got to tune into the show. Get the predictions before you fill out your bracket. I know. Well, so this puts a lot of pressure on you. I mean, oh, the man. fact that you called the Big Ten Championship game, there are going to be a lot of people now who are going to say. This will be a little bit harder. What, what do you got here? Is, uh, yours is not filled out, though, yet. It's blank. In my head, I yeah. kind of know where teams okay. are going, but I've not filled it out yet. Okay. All right. Well, again, you've raised the bar. <laughs> so the expectations at this point is you will get every game right. It'll be the first ever perfect bracket. Uh, let's get into our big story. It's actually the game yesterday. We want to do justice to the win that Trent predicted. Illinois 93, Wisconsin 87, fourth ever Big Ten tournament title for the Illini. Terrence Shannon had 34, most for any player ever in the Big Ten championship game. One day after he set the tourney single game scoring record for any game with 40. He was named the most outstanding player. He was incredible. This was a really fun game. Uh, what did you take from Illinois' performance and, and what we saw from the Badgers as well? A very high-level game. I mean, both teams exchanging, you know, knockout blows, it seemed like. Players stepping up, playing at, at, at a high level. You can't say enough about Terrence Shannon, 102 points in three games. <laughs> he shot 44 free throws, 38 for 44 from the free throw line. He's knocking down three, so... His play combined with Marcus Damas, those two were so good for Illinois. And then I thought even how Coach Underwood, for example, used Dane Danger, was, was great against Ohio State, didn't play much against Nebraska. And then second half against Wisconsin, when they were beating him up on the interior, played him alongside Coleman Hawkins, something they hadn't done much that year. So coaching staff, give them a ton of credit, playing through your playmakers, I mean, a, a good win against a Wisconsin team that was playing very, very well. Really well. I mean, I think Wisconsin can take a lot from this tournament, right? Sure. This was a team that stumbled through February. They had lost 8 of 11 coming into the Big Ten tournament. They win three games in three days, get themselves to the title game, had a double-digit lead in the second half of the game. Man, I think if you're Wisconsin, you feel really good that this is the team that you had in November, most of November anyway, and certainly December and January got as high as number six in the country. And I think America understood why as they watched them yesterday and really all weekend. And, and so I think both teams come out of it feeling really good. You should. You should. You, you see your name called, but you don't just want to get into the tournament, right? And, and you look at matchups. You want to be playing your best basketball right now in March. Illinois, Wisconsin, there's no doubt. If you look at anybody in the Big Ten, those two teams are playing really, really well. That sets them up, I think, to have continued success here this weekend. Let's get into those tourney matchups that are coming up this weekend as we look at the six Big Ten teams in the dance. Michigan State will kick off the day on Thursday against Mississippi State. And then those Illini have a mid-afternoon tilt with Moorhead State. The other four teams play Friday. Northwestern FAU is the early game. In Brooklyn, Nebraska plays in the evening against AM and in Memphis. Purdue will face either Montana State or Grambling in Indy. And then Wisconsin has James Madison. So let's start with Purdue. I, you don't want to overlook anyone based on what happened last year. But if, if you were to kind of mentally advance them past that first game, you've got Utah State or TCU potentially next. You've got Kansas in there as well, a very wounded four seed. They play in Indy. They play in Detroit. I mean, again, you hesitate this time of year to kind of look at any bracket and say you know what's going to happen. But, man, Purdue's got to feel good about the way this played out for them. I think they definitely have to. Of course, the venues. They're going to have great fan support in Indianapolis, in, in, in Detroit. That's not insignificant, especially as a higher-seeded team. If a lower-seeded team makes a run, you know that the, the crowd's going to turn on you. They might not feel that as much as other teams would. So I like that. You know, just looking ahead to a little bit, okay? I think Utah State and TCU, I think there's better, more dangerous 8-9 seeds out there. I agree. I will say this about Utah State. That league was good. Yes. Mountain West was good. And the Big 12, obviously, TCU, yeah. Yeah, right. TCU, league. kind of a middle-of-the-pack mm -hmm. Big 12 team. 
Utah State won a league that put six teams in the dance. Yes. And they won it in the regular season. Again, I'm not I'm not sounding any alarm bells, but I'm just saying, certainly, if anything else, Purdue has learned you don't overlook anyone. I'm not suggesting they would. I think Utah State's a pretty tough draw if that's who you end up with. In For the sure. They, they got a big guy, uh, Osobar. Yes, big, very Big, big, big body. So yes. he, he can, you know, because of his size at 6'8", 250, he can do some damage. Ian Martinez, guard from Maryland. You know, he's seen this Purdue team before. He's played against Zachy. He might be able to give his coach, his teammates, a few tips uh, of facing a guy like Edie. So, yes, nobody is, is going to – you don't take anybody lightly. I do like this this road, at least those first couple games for yeah. Purdue. I think the critical thing for them is, you know, as you know, Zach Eady, National Player of the Year. I think the most important player though is Braden Smith, and he's faltered a little bit. You know, got banged up that game. wasn't at his A game in the Big Ten tournament, and I think he's the key. Look, this is a good team. Uh, they're going to play through Zach Eady. They shoot the ball so much better. They've shot it confidently this year, even in close games. I love that. I didn't feel that last year at this point in time. But Brain Smith, he's got to be on his game, in my opinion. The biggest thing that concerns me about Purdue is it just felt like Zach Eady and everyone else this weekend. I mean, Lance Jones was the only other player who scored in double figures. He had 10 in their first game. And they played 45 minutes in the game against Wisconsin. They only had one double-figure scorer. And it was Zach Eady, and you do wonder a little bit whether these players, I hate to use complimentary guys because, you know, Braden Smith's a superstar. I mean, his first team all Big Ten. But will these players step up when the spotlight is shining the brightest? That, to me, is the challenge for Purdue. It can't just be Zach Eady, as fabulous as he is. What about Illinois? I had a great weekend. I think you look at this team, and you don't have to squint very hard to look at them and think this is a team that can make the Final Four. I think they're in the most challenging bracket. I mean, I think the East is absolutely brutal. You have UConn is really good. You have Iowa State's a two seed. They could have easily been a number one seed. I think a lot of the metrics would dictate that they are. So this won't be an easy road for Illinois, but it's not going to be easy against anyone who faces them either. Yes, and I would not look too far ahead. You know, Moorhead State, they give Indiana that great game earlier. Jordan Lathan right. went for 30-plus points. And another guy, um, uh, Minix, that can go 6-7. He goes for 21-10. and 10. I think Illinois will handle Moorhead State pretty easily. But, Dave, before Iowa State, before UConn, I think Illinois will get to, will get to those games in Boston. BYU, I look at that next opponent. Yeah. This team shoots a ton of threes. Over 50% of their shots That's are threes. Crazy. I think yes. they have seven guys that score nine points or more. So right. this is a very balanced team. They're Big 12 tested. They shoot the ball. That's always dangerous. But I will say with Illinois, I, I think every time they roll out the ball, whether they play UConn or whomever they play, you feel like you got the two best players on the court in Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damas. And as a coach, as a teammate, that feels pretty good. Even against UConn, you think they got the two best players? I, I think Brad Underwood would feel like, hey, I'll take Terrence Shannon yeah. over anybody you got. And you know what? At this okay. level, Marcus Damas, how he's playing, I think Illinois feels that way. So this, you know, it's not going to be easy. I like, I like how they're, I love how they're playing right now. And I, I see them getting past Moorhead State. BYU is going to be an absolute shootout. It, it might is. Be first. B BYU to me is a little reminiscent of Nebraska stylistically. That's a good, that's, yeah. That's a good point, Dave. team yeah. that shoots a lot of threes, and, and we saw that was so a – It's going to be a fun one. Competitive. That would be a great game. And then you'd have a huge contrast where they to face Iowa State because Iowa State is an incredible defensive team, and we saw what they did against Houston. I mean, actually just throttled them on Saturday and, and really stifled them offensively. So, I, again, the East is really hard. I mean, I think it's far and away the toughest bracket. But, again, you look at Illinois, you're going to have to be good teams to no win doubt. the NCAA no tournament. Doubt. It's kind of the, the way the whole thing is set up. Uh, the Badgers, uh, let's talk a little bit about them. Starting to look like the team that we thought they would be. Anyone who follows the Big Ten knows James Madison is not going to be a pushover. This is a team that went into the Breslin Center and beat Michigan State in the season opener. They have the longest active winning streak of any team in the country. This will be a challenging opener and a fashionable 12 over five upset pick. Yeah, it's this is a popular pick. And uh, so I think a lot of people look at Wisconsin's road and are like, man, they got them, then potentially Duke, who's loaded with pros. I actually like this for Wisconsin getting to the Sweet 16. So James Madison, you got to watch out. I think A.J. Storr, Terrence Edwards, on uh, James Madison, 6'6", kind of do-it-all player. He goes for over 17 a game, had 24 against Michigan State to kick off the season. That's going to be a really good matchup. I, I, I just really like how they're playing. They're balanced, they're deep, they're experienced. Chucky Hepburn, 22 against Purdue, 20 against Illinois. 
as the lead guard. He's playing like a, a, a real leader, an all Big Ten caliber player. I love that for Wisconsin. So I think it's, it's popular to pick against him. I got them in the Sweet 16. Yeah, look at that maybe that next round matchup against Duke. Again, a lot of pros. Yes. But a, but a young team. Yeah. I like how Wisconsin can win defensively, can win offensively. So a tough road, but I do get them going. I, I have them going to the Sweet 16. The Duke game would be really interesting. This is not a vintage Duke team. I mean, it's a good Duke team, but it's not a great Duke team. And, and we've seen some of the teams that Wisconsin has hung with and beaten this year. I mean, you know, they're two games removed from beating Purdue. There's yep. no reason they can't knock off Duke. There, there, there's no doubt they can't, again, get past James Madison. Though I right. like how they're playing, though. I like their, their – when I say their balance and depth, it's just, not just their bench, but their balance offensively. They can play through the post. Their perimeters can go. We saw them start knocking down shots <clears throat> in the Big Ten tournament. If they're making threes, I mean, they can hang with anybody in the country. Yeah, so they are in the south, the number one seed there. Obviously, is Houston. You cross that bridge when you come to it. We'll get, we'll get there. There's yeah. a little ways down the line, but obviously an outstanding defensive team with Kelvin Sampson and company. So, again, that is uh, the top few teams in the Big Ten heading into the dance. we got lots more to come. We're going to run through the rest of the NCAA tourney teams. We'll see if they can overcome the challenge of being in that 8-9. And we're going to dive into the women's bracket. Megan McEwen will be here. Everything you need to know about the seven teams that will represent the Big Ten in March Madness. Our big stat is brought to you by Gatorade Nebraska into the NCAA tourney just the eighth time ever. They end the longest drought in the Big Ten, their first birth in 10 years, just their second this century. The Huskers are the only power conference team that's never won an NCAA tourney game. They will try to end that skid against Texas A&M. On Friday, just a fascinating subplot. You've got Trev Alberts, who just left Lincoln as the athletic director to go to Texas A&M last week. And not only are the Nebraska men playing Texas A&M, the Nebraska women are playing Texas A&M, too. So there's going to be a lot of interest in this game for a variety of different reasons. But let's get into the matchup itself. And it would just be so big for Nebraska to win this one game, kind of irrespective of anything else that would happen down the line. So let's dive into it. What do you think against Buzz Williams and company? I think they're going to get it done. I think they will get a win. They will get their first uh, win as a program in NCAA tournament history. Now, Texas A&M is a good ball club. Really defensive-minded minded team. Uh, the best offensive rebounding team in the country. They're led by their guards, Wade Taylor, Tyrese Radford. Two experienced guys. Those guys combined go for 35 points. So Nebraska... Of course, you got to defend. You got to keep those guys out of the paint. Right. Once you get into rotations, forget about rebounding the ball. So you got to keep those guys in front. They got to handle the boards. Now, I do like with their front line. They've gone bigger, you know, midway through the year with Gary, Alec, and Rink Mast. Right. I like those three rebounding the ball. Bryce Williams as another big guard. He gets in there and rebounds. So they can get it done. Will not be easy. But I also say this, Dave, they beat Texas A&M. It's almost like a tune-up for Houston because Houston – is a similar type of team, yeah. great guard play, Shed, LJ Cryer, these guys, great on the offensive glass, physical team. They're a little bit better, I think. They are, I it'll mean, be a tune-up, maybe. I think what you're saying is Texas A&M has a little bit of a feel of a Houston light. Yeah, for sure, yeah. But, I mean, Texas A&M is a dreadful offensive team, other than the fact, and Rafael and I were talking about this last night, it is an absurd number. They get 42% of their misses That's wild. on the offensive glass. Now, there are a lot of misses to get. Well, that's okay. I mean, they are, again, <laughs> like you look at their effective field goal percentage, it's in the top uh, bottom 15 in the country. I mean, they literally can't shoot, but they figure out a way. And, right, I mean, I think this is the genius of basketball. There's so many different ways to win. Their way to win is play great defense, pound the offensive glass. If Nebraska were to be so fortunate to win that game and they were to get – Houston, again, Jamal Shedd's one of the best guards in the country. Kelvin Sampson, as we know, his teams play fabulous defense. What would you think of that matchup? Well, I think Nebraska has a distinct style play, and that's why I could see them making a run. Am I going to put all my money on it? You know, that's a different story. Right. But they have the, the goods. They have the style. They space the floor as well as anybody. They share the ball. They shoot, you know, what, 45% or so of their shots are three. So right. they can get hot like anybody. And they're a team that really thrives off of the emotion, the flow of a game. And if things turn in their favor, any of these games, you know, the crowd will get behind them. Everybody loves Kasey Tominaga. Yes. So you can feel, you were there in Minneapolis, you can feel the, the, the buzz, the energy in the crowd. So that really, that happens at the NCAA tournament, unlike any other place. So, 
you know, one, I, I like watching this team play because of the, yeah. the, the style of play, how they share the ball, rink mass stepping away from the court. What that does is it opens up the paint. They have great cutting action, great handoff actions. You know, Tominaga off the ball, Bryce Williams, Juwan Geary slashing. So they can do it. Now it's going to be really tough. One game at a time. Yes. But I do just, I think if they can get past Texas A&M, it's a little bit of tune-up for what they'll see in the next round. And maybe Nebraska is a bit different of a team than A&M and that Houston have seen throughout the course of their seasons. Man, it's been a great story. They are so much fun to watch. To your point, there's so many different players who can beat you. And I know how important it would be and how meaningful it would be for them to figure out a way to get that first ever tourney win. Uh, let's uh, turn the page to Michigan State. They seemed to be on the bubble Although the committee did not necessarily see it that way. They're actually the best of the nine seeds in their eyes. 26th straight NCAA tourney berth that extends the longest streak in Big Ten history, the second longest active streak, and as you can see, the third longest all time. All things considered, I think they were treated really well. They get a game against Mississippi State. It was a good athletic team, very good backcourt. They played a couple Big Ten teams in Northwestern and Rutgers and beaten them both this year. If you win that game, you likely get North Carolina. But again, it's Tom Izzo in March. I, I just think he has to feel really, really good about where they are and the fact that they avoided Dayton because there were a lot of people who had them playing in that first four. Yeah, I think you just got to feel good about getting there because now you're there. <clears throat> Izzo can work his magic. You have experienced guards. They've been in big moments before. Um, look, Mississippi State, they got a freshman guard. Five, t five foot ten, Josh Hubbard Dynamic. can really go. I mean, just <laughs> really a great good. athlete. Had 29 against Northwestern, had 34 against Kentucky. So the, the backcourt matchups, you know, Hogard, uh, Tyson Walker, you know, who's going to match up against him? Trey Holloman coming off the bench will be so crucial. I think they're going to be really fun watching them. Those guys go at it. Mississippi State in general is a, a defensive-minded, physical team. You know, not too, you know, different from Michigan State. That's really has, has improved defensively. Yes. Yeah, I know they're not strong on the inside, but we know who they are. And, and I always go back with Michigan State. I, I think it's Malik Hall and A.J. Hogart are the keys. Those guys are capable of going for 30 points combined. And if they're doing that, I mean, they truly can compete with anybody. Just can they find that magic, magical run right now? Uh, we'll see. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see how, how they do because – they could get it done, but uh, it's going to be tough. You just don't bet against them this time no. of year because of Tom Izzo's track record. And it feels like it's teams like this that he often has his best success with, right, when people don't expect them to play well. I, I think North Carolina, I mean, if, if they were to get to them, like no one's going to intimidate Michigan State based on who they played this year. I, North Carolina's probably the least of those one seeds I would say so, you know, I think you can make an argument. Michigan State absolutely could hang with them. You look at the teams they've hung with and beaten in the Big Ten this year. But again, Mississippi State, as you said, a really good defensive team. And we see the way that Michigan State has struggled offensively. It, it's going to have to be more than just Tyson Walker for them to figure out a way to get a win here. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I circle Hogard and Hall. I think those guys are yep. critical. But across the board, this is, they have enough shooting, I think, to make a run. Trey Holloman showed that at points this year. Jay Nakins on the wing has shown that. Malik Hall, when he's really uh, that versatile matchup, uh, they could make a, make a run. So if they can get past Mississippi State, that would be a fun matchup. You know, two blue bloods in that round of 32 against yes. North Carolina. Losers of five of seven coming in. Finally, Northwestern, they get an FAU team that I think a lot of people thought might not make the dance. So if you're a nine seed facing an eight seed, again, FAU made the final four last year. So and, and basically returned essentially the entire same group of players. But they, they've been inconsistent this year. I think if you're Northwestern, you look at that draw. I mean, we'll, we'll leave aside UConn and who they'd be playing next. But I think you feel okay. To, to me, the issue is, you know, it's obvious Matthew Nicholson isn't playing now based on the way that he was introduced yesterday on a, on a scooter. Yeah. And he got a seven-footer here in Vlad Golden, who we saw in the tournament last year. He's pretty good. Yeah, Golden's a big boy. Seven, seven-foot-one, can really, really effective around the basket. You know, now Northwestern, they're going to trap him. And so that could negate him a little bit. I think rebounding the ball will be crucial for Northwestern. This game is just going to be a lot of fun to watch. Some great shot makers on both sides of the ball. FAU, John L. Davis, Elijah Martin. They, they, they play four or five guards at a time. But those two in particular are really good, high-powered guys. 
going up against Bowie, Langberg, you know, Brooks Barnheiser, I, I think he's, he has a Swiss Army knife, can do so many different things. When he's on his game, when they're shooting the ball well, Northwestern can definitely make a run. Uh, but this game, I think it's just going to be for, for basketball kind of purists, two teams that can share the ball, have shot makers. This game is going to be a lot of fun to watch. You know Northwestern will make it competitive because other than the game that they played at Illinois where they got blown out, they did not lose a game by double figures this year. It's going to be a close game. And then you've got Boo Booey down the stretch, a guy who you feel good about. To me, it comes down to they essentially have four players who can score, right? Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's unfortunately, that's what it is. That's, that's what it's become because of all the injuries that they have. You can't have it just be Boo Booey. I mean, that, that was the issue to me in the Big Ten tournament is Boo Booey was great against Wisconsin, but Brooks Barnheiser was way off his game. I mean, really did not play well at all. Ryan Langborg, who is still battling an ankle injury, was silenced somewhat in that game. He did hit 1-3. Nick Martinelli missed a bunch of point-blank shots, and they were still there in spitting distance there in, in the final few minutes. But someone else is going to have to step up other than Bowie. The margin for error is really small for yes. this team. But what they've done a great job of is just keeping games close. They, they slow the game down. They'll play at a very deliberate, very slow uh, pace. Then they have guys that can score late shot clock situations. And, yeah, it can't just be Bowie. It's Nick Martinelli getting into his bag of trips, kind of an awkward, difficult matchup. Brooke, Brooks Barnheiser getting a different matchup. Uh, Ryan Langberg, big-time success a year ago in the NCAA tournament with right. Princeton. We'll see if he can return some of that March magic that he had going on last year. So, uh, again, I just think this game is going to be a, a ton of fun to watch. And they're as battle-tested as any group. I think they're as connected, as tough as any team that we have in the Big Ten. And it'll be fun to see them play out on this stage and, and maybe have a, a great matchup against the, the overall number one seed in UConn. Yeah, that would be a challenging one as well. Again, the absence of Nicholson, you know, they, they kind of figured out a way to play without Barry, but without Nicholson now, I mean, you look at the matchup, you get Golden, and then you get Donovan Clinton if, well, they, if you yeah, advance. And, and they right? trap, so I think I hear you, stopping but them, but they it's could use a, They could use well, a seven-footer. Could, could. I yeah. think it's rebounding. Someone to finish around the basket to right, help. Right, All right, good stuff. Uh, we're going to dive into the NIT coming up with Trent in just a bit, but we are going to turn our attention to the women next seven teams dancing there. Megan McEwen has the entire bracket figured out and she's going to help us sort through it next. Seven Big Ten women's hoops teams are dancing. It's tied for the most ever. It is the fifth time the conference has gotten seven. It happened as recently as last year. It includes a one seed for the second straight season. Remember, it was Indiana last season. It's Iowa this year. Ohio State gets a two, Indiana, Nebraska, Michigan, Michigan State, and Maryland rounding out the Big Ten's bids. Megan McEwen is here with us now. She's going to be calling the games in Columbus, so we'll get to Ohio State in just a bit. Let's start with Iowa, though, Megan. This is not an easy draw. I mean, you look through their bracket. LSU, UCLA, K-State, a team that already beat them once this year. Now, they beat them as well. They've already played twice, but... I mean, for a one seed, man, this is not an easy path at all. What do you make of what the Hawkeyes are up against? Dave, when I saw the bracket revealed for that regional, my jaw dropped. <laughs> Iowa and Caitlin Clark, who has set every single te television viewership record the last year, is now going to face the hardest path to get to the Final Four. UCLA, at one point, was ranked second in the nation. They have a 6'8 player in Lauren Betts, who's fantastic down low. LSU needs no introduction, beat Iowa in the national championship last season. Kansas State already beat Iowa this year, one of their few losses. Now, a week later, they were able to play in Fort Myers in a Thanksgiving tournament, and they were able to get some revenge, but still a 6'7 Aoka Lee. All three of those teams I just named have a dominant post present, which is the one area where Iowa struggled a bit this year was defending really good post players. It is going to be fascinating to see some of the matchups we are set to get for the Sweet 16 weekend. The committee did not make it easy on Iowa at all, but I love what Caitlin Clark told our Justine Ward last night. To be the best, you have to beat the best. 
That's the mindset this Iowa team has. Lisa Bluter says it all the time. Pressure is a privilege. And right now, there's a ton of pressure on the Hawkeyes. There is a ton of pressure. They're going to be very much in the spotlight. I, I think you'd rather beat the best in the Final Four <laughs> than beat them That's fair. in yes. your region. But, I, I, I'd but, imagine, yes. Yeah, Sh- I'm shocked the committee did this. Yeah, I, it, I really, it am. really there's is. There's no guarantee I was in the four, Final Four. There's no guarantee right no now. No doubt. Yeah, and that's, that's the challenge there. Number one seed, first time since 1992. You know they're going to be in the spotlight, and they've responded really well to that this year. There's so much pressure on this team, but they have always been up to it. I mentioned you're going to be in Columbus, so give us the lowdown, first of all, on the Buckeyes and Maine, and then potentially that matchup with Duke, where the seeds to hold. I'm really excited to see what Ohio State has in store when it comes to the NCAA tournament. This is a team that was playing its best basketball at the end of February, had that hiccup in the Big Ten tournament, losing to a hot Maryland team. Ohio State presses at such a high level. They turn teams over. They create extra possessions. They're deep and they have experience. All of those aspects are huge when it comes to trying to make a deep run in March. Maine, going to be interesting to see that matchup. The Buckeyes will likely have no problem. What's intriguing is the 7-10 matchup in that region between Duke and Richmond. Richmond was a dominant team in the Atlantic 10 this year. Really, really solid group coming into Columbus. Duke, ACC, arguably the best conference in women's basketball this season. So if Duke were to beat Richmond and we have a Duke-Ohio State matchup to go to the Sweet 16, Celeste Taylor of Ohio State just transferred to Columbus from Durham. So just a little dramatic storyline right there, what's going to happen in that. But Ohio State is in a really good position to make a deep run in their region. I like their draw. I think the way they play, the press, and how fast they play makes them a really tough matchup for a lot of teams in that region. Uh, Taylor was the ACC Defensive Player of the Year last year, the Big Ten Defensive Player of the Year this year. We'll see if she can get the Buckeyes to the Final Four for the first time since 1993. Uh, Let's turn our focus to Indiana. They do get to host as a four seed. I think that was a little tenuous, so they have to feel good about that. They start with Fairfield. If they can get out of Bloomington, you've got South Carolina looming, and everyone knows who follows women's basketball even tangentially that that's the number one team the unanimous number one undefeated all that stuff let's talk about the immediate challenges though for indiana before they would get to the gamecocks dave i just called the mac championship game where fairfield was down to niagara and came back from down 14 to win the game in overtime this is a fairfield team that's in the top 25 for a reason even as a mid-major they went 20 and 0 in the conference season their one loss this year is to vanderbilt where they lost by three a very deep polished team they play five out motion offense a lot of passing cutting everybody touches the ball everybody scores at a high level indiana is one of the most disciplined teams in the country when it comes to both the defensive and offensive ends that's going to be fascinating also a side note the head coach of fairfield is carly tebow didonis who was an assistant coach at minnesota so she knows the big 10 very well Oklahoma is a team that won the Big 12, really, really strong team with athletic big post players that can play facing up. The key for Indiana is going to be, can McKenzie Holmes stay healthy and can the team as a whole stay healthy? I truly believe if the Hoosiers hadn't been plagued by injuries in the second half of the year, they could have been a three or two seed in this tournament. But dealing with some injuries, frustrations down you know, the stretch here, they're with the four. They're happy to be hosting. This could be a really interesting pod, though, as you take a look at that region. Fifth straight tourney appearance there for Indiana. Let's focus on Nebraska. They were treated, I think, very fairly, and there had been some thought that maybe they would slide down as low as an eight seed. They end up with a six seed. That's their best in more than a decade. What do you think of the matchup with Texas A&M? Well, how about just the fighting Trev Alberts now? I, know. I mean, <laughs> we already talked A&M. about that. We were talking about the men. It's crazy. Like, just the, <laughs> the, the fact that, that a men's and women's team would play the same opponent. I mean, I'd be fascinated to know when the last time that happened was. I'm sure someone has looked that up. I just haven't seen it. But it's crazy that that would happen. But then for them to be playing the team that their athletic director just left for a week ago. I mean, that is it's nuts. It's a crazy yeah. story. You know, there, somebody has a sense of humor somewhere when it came to that matchup. Yeah. But nonetheless, Nebraska is playing some of its best basketball right now. I was over the moon impressed with their run in the Big Ten tournament to play four games in four days. 
lose to Iowa in overtime, like they have been so, so strong down the stretch. This is the time that you want to peak. Alexis Markowski and Jazz Shelley are about maybe some of the two best inside outside duos in the country. The key here, though, is, you know, you have to play in Corvallis at Oregon State. If you win game one going into game two, it's always tough. As many of you know, the top 16 teams in the tournament or seeded one through four get to play at home sites. So it will be an away game for them. Nonetheless, Nebraska's depth, their confidence and momentum right now is going to allow them to be in a really good position to make a Sweet 16 run. What about Michigan State? This has been a great story this year under Robin Freilich. They improved their win total in the Big Ten by five. They play North Carolina in the first matchup. They have to go to the Carolinas to play. And, and if they win that one, it's South Carolina next. I mean, this is no easy draw at all. But Michigan State, I mean, it, the, the turnaround and the excitement surrounding this program is huge. And that's an intriguing 8-9. I mean, that's certainly a game they can win against the Tar Heels. North Carolina, a very good team out of the ACC. Michigan State does two things well. They press and they can knock down threes. That's a very tough duo to have to try to slow down and stop. In that sense, I really think Michigan State has the edge in this game over North Carolina. Bodies are going to be fresh. You have the momentum from having a great season, the experience of players like Tori Osman and Julia A-Raw, D.D. Hageman. It's going to be really interesting down the stretch. Now, look, South Carolina is the best team in this tournament. If you had to ask me South Carolina versus the field, who wins the title, my money's on South Carolina right now wow. just because they can knock down the three this year. Not last season when Iowa exploited that in the final four, but right now South Carolina is shooting 40% from three as a team. They have a 6A Camelia Cardosa in the paint who is so dominant offensively and defensively. They have some depth. I just don't know anybody that can keep up with them and stop all of the weapons they have on the floor. So that would be a really tough matchup and a massive upset if Michigan State can get it done to go to the Sweet 16. Let's focus on Michigan. They will head west. They first take on Kansas and then potentially USC, which of course means Juju Watkins. Uh, let's again focus on first things first. And Michigan has been so good in opening round games in the NCAA tournament. It feels like Kim Barnes Rico kind of has this part of the tournament fairly well figured out again one of those really intriguing matchups where you feel like it's kind of a coin flip what do you see against the Jayhawks Michigan defends at a high level and that will always give you an advantage in a first round NCAA tournament game Kim Barnes Rico is one of the best coaches when it comes to coaching ball screen defense her teams have always been at lead at coming out with the high hedge and having her bigs be able to get back to who they're guarding they rotate well they communicate at a high level that's going to be key when it comes to facing teams that you haven't seen before because a lot of teams aren't used to facing really strong ball screen defense teams Michigan Another team playing with a ton of momentum from the Big Ten tournament. They were on the bubble headed into that tournament. I'm so thankful that they played well and were able to get in. They deserve it. They are an NCAA tournament team. And then we have a potential Big Ten matchup next year with USC yeah. and Michigan. So that's going to be a ton of fun to potentially see down the stretch. But any team that defends at a high level, you always have a shot to make a run in the tournament. Well, Shimmy and I were talking about this last night on our preview show. I mean, give people who haven't watched, like, give them a sense of, of Juju Watkins and what makes her so special because we're going to have her next year in our league, and it feels like she's kind of the heiress apparent to Caitlin Clark. If you enjoy watching Caitlin Clark play basketball, you're going to enjoy Juju Watkins playing basketball. She is smooth, poised. She can do everything, and her moves and her game is so mature. She does not play like a freshman, and she can do other things, too. She's a playmaker. She has all these layers to her game. Her numbers are very similar. They actually might be better in some aspects than Caitlin Clark's were her freshman year. It is just the beginning for Juju Watkins, and she is about as humble as they come. Well, that's going to be a ton of fun next year. I, we do want to focus on Maryland here really quickly. I mean, this is a team that had so many challenges this season, and yet they do get into the dance. They're a 10 seed. You could kind of see that collective sigh of relief. I think Brenda Freeze, we had some sound bites from her yesterday on our show, and you could tell that given everything they've been through, she's just delighted to be there. Listen. Maryland was going to get into that tournament because there are three guarantees, death, taxes, Brenda Freeze in March. <laughs> Just like that, you see the run Maryland made in the Big Ten tournament, making it to the semifinals. I was so impressed with how they pieced together that run. 
and they've dealt with injuries as well. Lavender Briggs goes out for the year. They've had so many different injuries that have compounded upon itself, and yet they still find ways to win. Cheyenne Sellers is playing the best basketball we have seen her play, both offensively and defensively. She is a leader on this team. I love Bree McDaniel, one of my favorite players in the Big Ten because of how pesky she is on the defensive end. And then you have Brene Alexander, who's shooting the ball at a really high clip from three. They have experience on that team. A ton of those players went to the Elite Eight last season. They understand what it's like to play on this stage. I love this matchup with Iowa State. Brenda Freeze used to coach under the legendary Bill Fenley at Iowa State. Yeah. It's always fun to see this, but I tell you what, this pod of games has some of the best coaching in the tournament between Tara Vanderveer, Bill Fenley, and Brenda Freeze. Yeah, Tara Vanderveer has uh, been pretty good, and of course, a lot of people thought her team should have been a one seed. They end up with a two seed, but they do host in Palo Alto. Megan McEwen, enjoy your time in Columbus. I know you love this time of year, as we all do. Have fun, have great calls, and thanks for spending a few minutes with us. Thanks, Dave. And also a big shout out for the Big Ten getting 12 of his 14 teams into postseason tournaments. That showed you how competitive the league was this season. Hockey semifinal Saturday. Top seed Michigan State wrote a great atmosphere at Mun Ice Arena to a 2-1 to one win over surprising Ohio State. It was the first home playoff win for the Spartans since 2008. In the other semi, Michigan won 2-1 at Minnesota. Third straight year, the Wolverines have topped the Gophers. In Minneapolis in the Big Ten tourney, T.J. Hughes, Gavin Brindley tallied the goals for the Maze and Blue. As promised, Cappy is here. Let's start with Michigan State. Ohio State played really well. Can we just, yes. like, get that out on the table? They played really well down They're the stretch. Very good, right? Beat Wisconsin yep. and, and then certainly gave Michigan State all they could handle. What ultimately won it for the Spartans? You know, I just think their depth. They don't rely on one guy, one line. And then they're great goaltending. Trey Hogstein's an 18-year-old freshman, but he's had his – he's been in the limelight for a couple years. He's a top USA goaltender. They went to World Juniors. He won that. It's well-documented. Won in Sweden in front of 11,000 Swedish fans. So, I'm like, you're not going to get a more uh, pressure situation than that this year. So, I think as an 18-year-old, it's not going to affect him. But I love their depth. And then they got goals scoring from their def senior defensemen. So – and then the atmosphere. I mean, Mun Ice Arena has been yeah. craving it. You mentioned it. Yes. They've been craving that. It's going to be even more bananas this next Saturday, but I think they fed off of that as well, and they they beat a feisty Ohio State Buckeye team. I mean, you think about the history of this program, and they're going to play in a conference championship for the first time since 2006, last time they won one, right? I mean, it's just crazy how yeah. long it's been, and you could see. I mean, that video that we had there was amazing. You were thirsty. And you see, Michigan's yeah. a huge hockey right. state it's one of the top most players come out of there were like the top three. So I just, you saw the fans. I, it's going to be crazier next week because they have their biggest rivalry right. in, in any sport. Uh, when you put them together, it's going to be amazing. I mean, we are nine years into Big Ten hockey, and it's the first time they've won a Big Ten. This is year 11. 11 years in. Yeah, I'm sorry. I've 11 been here years. since the beginning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's I, nuts. Count it, one, it's, it is. I mean, That's they didn't nuts. have their first playoff win until last year yeah so just to come that fast and Mike Gill's done an outstanding job yeah yeah tremendous all right how about Michigan they continue to be a postseason yeah. thorn yeah. in the gopher side <laughs> uh, Minnesota's lone goal came on its final shot so the the yeah. final score is a little bit deceptive it felt like Michigan had control of sure. this game really from the get-go what do you make of the Wolverines it feels like they are peaking at the right time is that fair to say they, they are, and I, I've kind of been saying it. I, they always seem to play well when their backs are against the wall or they may not make the NCAA tournament. Saturday's game was very simple. Like, Minnesota looked like they wanted to win. Minnesota, Michigan looked like they had to win. Mm. Like, they played desperate, but they played in control. Like, Michigan, they, they got this fantastic offense, but sometimes they get out of control and go too much offense, and they kind of leave their goalie high and dry. They played a controlled championship-style game. Uh, like you said, they controlled the game throughout. Um, the late goal by Snugger made it 2-1. to one, But I just love the way they're peaking right now. Minnesota, I think their goals, yes, they want to win Big Ten titles, but I know Bob Mosco, his big carrot is that NCAA ring. Yeah. they got to figure it out. They have a week off to, to get that going. But Michigan really played well Saturday. They deserved everything they got. Okay, so now we get Michigan and Michigan State <laughs> at Munn. Yeah. This will be the fifth time they've played this year. Michigan State's won three of them. But Michigan's but. win was 7-1 to one at Munn. So I, it has to give them some confidence. How yeah. do you see this matchup? I mean, I love it. I think special teams is huge. They both have great power plays. Now, 
these teams are going to be amped up. I, I don't know how, you know, hockey, the control your emotions. You want to play physical, you want to play fast, but you don't want to carry overboard, right, and give yourself, take that extra hit, get a penalty, and then give that number one Michigan power play or the number four in the country, Michigan State. So that's the early part of the game. Maybe when the dust settles, I think it's just going to be, you know, who wants, you know, the old cliche, who wants it more, who can, which goalie can make the big save in the big moment. But the emotions early on are going to be really interesting to see how te- they're e- able to kind of stay controlled, but also, you know, push the, pre- push the pace. I know you love this week and then the weeks that follow with oh, the yeah. NCAA tournament. You'll be in studio. Studio Saturday, Saturday, yes. All right, and Michigan, I'll, Michigan. I'll be State. in a regional, too, but we'll have time. A regional to be determined. Next, yes, yes, exactly. Uh, again, Big Ten Network, 8 o'clock Eastern time on Saturday. Michigan and Michigan State. Woo. going to be a ton of fun. Then putting three teams in the NIT. Two of them will host all three games are tomorrow. Ohio State welcomes Cornell. Iowa hosts K-State. Minnesota's going to go to Hinkle to battle Butler. Let's start with the Buckeyes. Tons of momentum. They announced Jake Diebler as their head coach. They are playing really well. I think there's a lot to be excited about. Maybe you can build on this NIT appearance. Well, this is great for them. One, I thought what Jake Diebler has done so well is he's played these freshmen more. They have this great group of sophomores, but Devin Royal, Scotty Middleton, use that bench. They have great momentum now. They're playing fearless basketball. So, they are, could definitely make a deep run in it now. So I, I'm really excited to see what Ohio State can do, what they can continue on, the success they've had the past month or so. I will tell you this. I follow Cornell more closely than one would think, given that I pay tuition there. <laughs> you uh, they, should. Yeah. Yes. Uh, they play a really fun style. I mean, fast, they're going to get up, up and, and down. down. They play yeah. really fast. They shoot a ton of threes. Yep. They're very well coached. I think this should be a, a really interesting game. But Ohio State, as we know, playing extremely well. I mean, they had Illinois in a tough spot in the Big Ten tournaments and, and the teams they beat the yeah, last month. Yeah, yeah, so. no, they've beaten as, it's been as been good great. as it gets. Yeah. They've been great, no doubt. Uh, Iowa and Kansas State, solid Wildcats team. They beat Iowa State last week, and we were talking about Iowa State maybe could have even been a one seed. So I think this is a good matchup, nice regional battle yeah. here. This should be a good game. Yeah, Tyler Perry, good guard for for Kansas State. Arthur Kaluma transfer from Creighton. They have some really good players. Uh, Iowa is a team, again, like Ohio State, I think could win this whole thing. And I think it suits – this is great that they're playing. You think of their freshman class, Dembele, Brock Harding, Owen Freeman. They've developed uh, – you know, Josh Dix is a sophomore. So getting these guys more opportunities to play, to gel, this is a great opportunity for them. And their high-powered offense, you know – they, they can make a deep run. It should be fun to, to watch them continue playing. As Kansas State team that's good defensively, I mean, they've beaten Baylor, Kansas, BYU, Iowa State. They've beaten some really good teams. So, again, uh, I think that's a compelling matchup. And then it was interesting. I had Minnesota's game against Northwestern a week and a half ago. And talking to Ben Johnson, he was saying, man, we would love to be in the NIT. He was talking about the way that Wisconsin used it as a springboard last year. Great and it point. turned into a really yeah. good year for them. Everyone can come back for Minnesota next year. I mean, every significant player could return. I think this is an amazing opportunity for them to gain some more momentum, which they already picked up. I mean, they were arguably the most improved team in the Big Ten. That's a fantastic point. It's so much about playing well and stuff is appreciating the opportunity, really you know, wanting to be there, wanting this moment. And it sounds like Minnesota does. This is big for them. To be able to play in here, continue to play in March, or go into play in a historic place in Hinkle Fieldhouse. Pierre Brooks, former Michigan State guy for Butler, is having a really good season uh, for them. So it won't be an easy one, but I would love to see them continuing going because Ben Johnson, he's got a great thing going up there in Minneapolis. Yeah, you get up against Thad Mata, so you know you're going to be up against a really well-coached team. But, yeah, I, I agree with you. I'm excited about this team next year. Look, I think the reality is, and you just have to put it out on the table, you have no idea who's going to come back year to year. This is kind of the world that we're in in college basketball. But I think you look at the patience that Minnesota has shown here. Ben Johnson has proven that he can recruit, and I love the way that they played this year. Again, you hope everyone comes back because if they do, I think that's a team that's top four preseason? There's no doubt they could you don't know what everyone, You don't know what it's going to look like with the portal. What I think only. should be fun is all three of these teams, I think, are trending in the right direction, yes. both this season but also for the future. So um, hopefully they can make a run in this tournament. All right. We're going to be following the postseason throughout here on Big Ten today. Great stuff out of Trent. We've got hockey awards tomorrow as well. Cappy will be back with me for that. We'll see you then.